a proactive government. Uh, Karen and I spoke last night with Terry about should we even raise these issues? Allow me to raise them here because this is a working group discussion. There has been a new national manufacturing policy, a new national competition policy recently published. They use the word competition, I'm just a layman. But allow me to pose the question. Think of the Wright Brothers airplane and think of the prop airplanes that fought in World War II and then think of the jet airplanes that we have flown in today. So from the Wright Brothers to the prop planes to the jet airplanes, isn't that incremental innovation? And which part of that innovation therefore should be protected? for intellectual property. And then medical pricing, the market-based pricing issue. Is price caps the issue? Right now there is a proposal to expand the essential list of medicines and to impose price caps. I would argue that that will dampen innovation. That will stunt the innovation. And on piracy, is there any more egregious answer, uh, example? Is there any more egregious example than Bollywood? Uh, where the films that are being produced in Bollywood, some of the greatest on earth, are showing in Islamabad and in Dubai before they're premiered in Bombay. In other words, add that perspective to the food and drug industry, to the pharmaceutical industry, we all need to be working more, more aggressively on enforcement. The absence of patent linkage, allow me to explain as a layman what that means. That means a man that goes for a marketing approval should have a burden of proof to demonstrate that there already is not a patent on that drug. Because why? If he goes to the market and he puts that product on the market, me as the patent holder has no choice but to go to the courts and we all know about the Indian judiciary. It's overloaded. And therefore, let there be greater burden of proof, greater patent linkage before someone gets marketing approval. And in terms of biosimilars and biologics, we need, to re we need to harmonize our regulatory structure between the United States and Europe and India because the truth is it's going to take collaboration around the world to make these biologics and these new drugs come to market. And so we need to have regulatory harmonization that underscores uh, that, that, that unification. To me, innovation is where we need to be headed. It isn't just low cost, high volume manufacturing any longer. It's moving up the value chain. That is India's great future. That is the future of the United States of America. And let me give you the best example, India's IT industry. Before the year Y2K, before year 2000, India was known only as the back office for the world's information technology activity. Today, 11 years later, India is at the forefront of creating value for every global company. It's value addition 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's creating value for our companies. Just like that, innovation and moving up the value chain is where we need to go with biotechnology and with pharmaceutical development. Here's the proposition, Karim Mazumdar Shah. You asked for an idea, and it relates to our home here in Karnataka. I would suggest that the proposition should be that we recognize, as Minister Azad mentioned, our central governments, both in the United States and in India, are distracted. They're busy. They have a lot going on. They have elections. They have the running of nations at their business. But look at how the states are innovating. There are certain states in India jumping ahead of others. I want Karnataka to be one of those states. So education is primarily a state subject. Let us be thinking here in Karnataka about how we develop that dizzying array of opportunity within 100 kilometers of Bangalore, the kind of choice that we mentioned regarding California and Palo Alto. In terms of Karnataka policy, roll out the red carpet and the welcome mat for clinical trials and research and development. And for the judiciary, which we know is very active these days, let's develop a patent in an IP tribunal where we can go immediately for patent protection or intellectual property infringement if there's a problem. In other words, let the innovator have access to justice. And then here's Karen Mazumda Shah's idea. Let's all get together and have Bombay not be the center of the financial community, but Bangalore for the new NASDAQ exchange for innovation high technology companies. If I were a young entrepreneur in this audience, I would be thinking, how do I develop a new stock exchange here in Bangalore 
for the new innovative technologies. This is how companies get funding. This is how companies raise money to go to market. And then we need to have our proactive government, our chief minister and our minister Acharya, focus on making infrastructure a priority. It goes right to MK Bond's statement. Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. About connectivity, about efficiency, and about safety and security. That is what infrastructure represents to all of us here. And above all, we need to reward and we need to protect intellectual property. When are we going to value intellectual property to the extent that we should? Because that's what inspires innovation. And so, Karen, here's the big idea. The big idea is that we ask the government of Karnataka to establish Bangalore as a special innovation zone. And we encourage Bangalore and Karnataka to develop these kinds of policies in the absence of these policies at the central government, le le uh, at the central government level. Why is this possible? Well, I believe that this is India's century. India's century was able in 2008 to put this Chandrayaan rocket into lunar orbit. It joined only six other countries in entering the lunar orbit. If we can go to the moon, then we can do anything. And let me finish by saying why India and why the United States in India. Because India is a coherent and pluralistic democracy. When you think of Manmohan Singh, a minority Sikh, when you think of Minister Azad, a Muslim, when you think of uh, Priyanka Gandhi and Rahul, uh, Hindus, when you think of the entire setup in India, it is the most extraordinary snapshot of democracy in action. It is pluralistic, it is open, it is accepting. That is to India's great credit. Why India? Because it's big. It's one-fifth the world's population, 1.2 billion people, it's number one in the world in milk production. It's number two in the world in fruit and vegetable production. It's the second largest military in uniform in the world. India is important. We have common values that the United States shares with India in fighting terrorism, in stopping human trafficking, and in stopping the scourge of narcotics. We've been working together on this for the last 40 years together as partners. And as ideological geopolitical partners, we both work to restore democracy in Nepal, in stopping the civil war in Sri Lanka, in modulating the rise of Islamic fanaticism in Bangladesh, and to Dr. Manmohan Singh's credit, to reach out to Pakistan, and to reach out to China, and to bring them into the free market fold. We all share the English common law legal system. We were colonialized by the British. They left the legacy of English common law with both of our countries. It makes doing contracts in India similar to doing contracts in the United States. India is the largest population of English-speaking peoples on earth. And then India produces, after the United States, the second largest number of doctors, engineers, and PhDs in the world. We have a whole dais filled with them. We have 100,000 students a year from India coming to the United States. We need to be developing more American students coming to India. And there is that magic bridge, that connection that all of us here are related to, and that's 2.8 million Americans of Indian origin who have never forgotten their motherland, but who appreciate and respect and, and are patriots about the United States of America. We have seen that India has become politically significant and politically integrated. And the last point here is 54% of India's 1.2 billion population is under the age of 25. This represents a population of hope, of aspiration, and of creativity, and ultimately of innovation. And I believe in my heart that the United States and India will shape the destiny of the 21st century. Thank you very much.